Okay, so first of all, thank you commissioners for giving us the opportunity to present the results of our study, which we completed earlier this year. Actually it was completed prior to that, but we published it uh, early this year. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present our results. A brief outline of what I'll cover today. First, uh, a few slides talking about the background of the groundwater conditions on Molokai. Uh, secondly, the motivation for our study, and then um, follow that up with a description of selected results for our study. Okay, so we do have a published report. Um, this study was done in cooperation with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and the Maui Department of Water Supply. Uh, like I said, we published this report earlier this year and it is available online at the website that's shown there. Uh, you can also access it through our uh, Pacific Islands Water Science Center homepage for the USGS. Uh, the results of the study are fully documented in that report and I'm just gonna really provide a very brief overview of what we did and some of the selected results. Okay, so this is a geology, a very generalized geology map of the island of Molokai. Uh, the main area of interest that we were concerned with was the Kualapu'u aquifer system, which is located uh, kind of in the central part of the island and is contained within the East Molokai volcanics, which are erupted from the East Molokai volcano. Uh, one of the main features geologically of the Kualapu'u aquifer system is that there are a number of these scattered vent features, volcanic vent features, such as the one shown, the Kualapu'u vent, which is a syndicone. Um, and these vents are important because they signify that in the subsurface, uh, they are fed by some kind of a, a plumbing or a dike system that can affect groundwater flow. So all of these surface vents are kind of manifestations of what's occurring in the under in the subsurface, and they indicate that there are subsurface dikes present in the in, in, in this aquifer system. Um, the dikes are important because they tend to impede groundwater flow. They have lower hydraulic activity or permeability than typical lava flows have that you see on, on the surface. Uh, so that's one of the important things about to keep in mind about the Kuala Pu'u aquifer system is that it has some complexity because of the presence of uh, these volcanic vents, which indicate that there are subsurface dikes present. Okay, there are a number of wells existing within the Kualapu'u aquifer system. Uh, one of them, well 15, was abandoned a while ago and it never really produced water that's suitable for drinking. Uh, the one towards the south, uh, further south is the Kualapu'u deep monitoring well uh, that well is just an observation well. Uh, but within the middle part, well 17, Kualapu'u Mauka, and Kauluvai 1 and 2, those are four active production wells within the Kualapu'u aquifer system. Um, and these are the wells, these are the existing wells that are of concern um, in terms of uh, future development. Okay, as part of our study, uh, we needed to estimate how groundwater recharge varied through time because we calibrated the model uh, since from about 1940 to fairly recent conditions. Um, and so we developed a water budget model to estimate uh, groundwater recharge over the entire island. And this bar chart here shows how that ground, estimated groundwater recharge varies over time or by decade. Uh, as it turns out, the wettest decade was the 1960s. Uh, during which groundwater recharge over the island was about 280 million gallons per day. And the driest decade was the 70s, uh, during which groundwater recharge was about 190 million gallons per day. Um, and you can see on the map on the bottom how the recharge is distributed spatially. In the Kuala Pulu area, which is in the central part of the island, um, most of the recharge is fairly low. It's in the orange and the yellow colors. The highest recharge occurs in those northeastern valleys of the island uh, where you see the bluer and green colors. Uh, 
Okay, so the motivation for uh, understanding groundwater availability on the island, and in particular in the Kuala Puku area, is that groundwater is the main source of drinking water for the people of the island. Um, and the demand for groundwater is expected to increase over time. Now, unfortunately, uh, groundwater resources are limited, particularly in the areas where it's needed the most. Uh, so for example, in the Kuala Pugu area, we saw in the previous slide, it was relatively dry, uh, low rates of groundwater recharge. And so that limits how much groundwater is available. Um, and finally, the effects of uh, additional groundwater development in the area are a bit uncertain. We don't know uh, how development of additional groundwater might affect the salinity of the water that's produced by these wells. Uh, nor do we have the ability to determine how much uh, groundwater discharge to the ocean is going to be affected by additional development. So that brings us to the study that we conducted. Um, the overall objective of our study was to evaluate groundwater availability primarily in central Molokai. Um, and we met this objective by developing a numerical groundwater model and that model was able to quantify changes in salinity and groundwater discharge to near shore areas. And we used that model to test a number of different what if scenarios. What would happen if we pump various wells at different rates or if we introduced new wells into the system, what would happen to uh, salinity and groundwater discharge to the coast? Um, and we developed these scenario, scenarios in consultation with both state and county agencies. And that would also include the Commission on Water Resource Management. Okay, so a, a groundwater model is basically a computer model. Um, it solves the equation of groundwater flow many times, both over space and over time. And these groundwater models integrate um, the available uh, geology, geologic and hydrologic information that we have. And the model, this particular model is capable of simulating both flow and salinity changes in the aquifer. And we're also able to quantify how uh, groundwater discharge to near shore areas might be affected if we start pumping additional groundwater. Okay, so I'm going to show you an animation that was generated um, from model results. Uh, but before I do that, I want to provide a brief explanation of what you're going to see. So first of all, in the map on the left, um, I'm going to show you kind of what happens in a vertical slice of the aquifer shown in that colored uh, slice of the island. And in the right uh, side of the figure, you can see two cross sections viewing from the east side of the island toward the west side of the island. Okay, so if you look at the top cross section, it has uh, different colors representing different water quality in the aquifer. The blue colors representing the fresher water and that grades downward into the redder colors representing salt water. Uh, in the bottom uh, cross section, and what you're gonna see in the animation is that I'm gonna remove the freshest blue area from the aquifer, just so that it uh, kind of makes it clearer what happens to the uh, thickness of that freshwater zone. And so what I've done is in the blue area that I've removed, um, I've basically basically removed all of the water, water that's um, of drinking water quality. So I've removed fresh water with less than 1% ocean water salinity. Okay, so you also see in the animation a number of these vertical features, which are going to start popping up. And these features represent wells that uh, come online during different periods of the animation. And then the last feature that I want to point you to is this bar graph, which shows how uh, groundwater withdrawals within the Kuala Pu aquifer system uh, have increased over time. And this year indicator is going to uh, change as the animation proceeds. Yeah, okay, so. uh, just a quick question. The bar, the charts on the right, are yes. they showing east to west? And if so, which side is east and which side is west? 
you're actually looking at a slice, a vertical slice of the aquifer from the east side of the island towards the west side of the island. So the, the north is actually shown on the right. Oh, I see. You have north on there. And then the south is towards the left. And you, I hope the animation will make this clear how we're viewing okay. on this cross section. Okay, so here we go. So we're taking a slice through the aquifer. And then we're going to zoom in and rotate it. So now you're seeing that we're looking from the east side of the island towards the west. Um, I removed all that freshest water. And then now we're going to kind of march through time and see what happens to the thickness of that freshwater zone. And you can see how the transition zone is going to move up and down in response to changes in groundwater recharge and withdrawals. And then starting in the 90s, when withdrawals started to increase, you can see how the transition zone rises up and so that it actually starts affecting uh, the water quality in some of the wells. Okay, so that that's, um, demonstrates kind of the uh, usefulness of this model. It can simulate changes in, in water quality that are uh, occur over time or under different types of pumping conditions. So what I'm gonna show you next is a couple or, or several applications of the model in looking at how salinity in some of the production wells change in response to changes in withdrawal and also how groundwater discharge to the nearshore areas change over time or actually over uh, with different pumping scenarios. Okay, so back in the 90s, uh, there was a task force looking at um, sustainability on the island of Molokai and based mainly on community input, um, a number of subsistence sites were identified in nearshore areas. And these are shown on this map. Some of them represent ocean gathering sites. Some of them represent uh, fishing sites. And the triangles represent sites that uh, might be pr need protection in the future. Um, and I put these up there just so that you have a perspective of the importance, potential importance of the coastal resources that could be affected by a reduction in groundwater discharge to the nearshore area. Um, I've also shown in the kind of the greenish colors right along the southern coast, you can see a number of fish ponds that extend uh, from the coastline. And these also could potentially be impacted if uh, fresh groundwater discharge to these areas is reduced as a result of additional groundwater withdrawal. Okay, so the first thing that we ran was kind of a base scenario, looking at average conditions um, in, in the model, we represented average 2016 to 17 withdrawals, which in the Kuala Pu'u aquifer system uh, totaled to about 1.5 million gallons per day distributed amongst those four existing wells. Um, and this uh, base case scenario um, indicates that the wells uh, produce water quality of a, a reasonable you know, drinking water quality. Um, to give you uh, a sense of uh, perspective, the model indicated that these wells produced uh, water with a chloride concentration of less than 100 milligrams per liter. And EPA's secondary standard for drinking water is 250 milligrams per liter. So the model would indicates that under a long-term condition, under existing kind of average withdrawal rates, um, water produced by the existing wells would be less than EPA secondary standard of 250 milligrams per liter chloride. Okay, the other thing that we used the model for was to evaluate how coastal uh, discharge would be affected. So we developed this base scenario to describe kind of the existing conditions. And um, what I've done in this map here is kind of summarized the where the groundwater discharge primarily occurs along the northern and southern parts of the island. And the colors of those squares indicate relatively, um, the, the darker colors indicate greater groundwater discharge and the lighter colors indicate uh, lesser groundwater discharge. And you can see the darker colors mainly are along the southern coast and more towards the eastern part of our area than the western part of the area. Um, and so this is 
this groundwater discharge pattern is going to serve as the base from which we compute uh, how much groundwater discharge reduction occurs when we start pumping more groundwater from the Kualapu aquifer system. Okay, so the first scenario that I'm going to present is uh, the pending water use permit rates from wells in Kualapu aquifer system. And these were the pending rates that existed at the time we ran the model back in 2019. Uh, the total withdrawal from all the wells was about 2.7 million gallons per day. So it's, it represents an increase over what I previously showed, which was about one and a half million gallons per day in the base scenario. So for the pending water use permit rates, we're increasing withdrawal from the Kualapu area by more than a million gallons per day. And that has an effect both in terms of water quality and in terms of uh, the groundwater discharge to the near shore area. So you can see, and the, the wells are kind of color coded in terms of the categories of uh, water quality. The green wells represent um, water that's less than 100 milligrams per liter as indicated by the model. And the yellow well indicates uh, water quality between 100 and 200 milligrams per liter chloride. And again, uh, all of these wells remain below the secondary EPA secondary standard of 250 milligrams per liter. Um, so the other aspect that we looked at was the reduction in coastal groundwater discharge. And that's indicated in the colored squares near the coast. And the darker squares represent a greater reduction in groundwater discharge relative to the lighter colors. And you can see that the darker colors are mainly um, uh, immediately north and kind of toward the, or uh, north and south of the production wells. And as you get further and further away along the coastline from those production wells, uh, the colors tend to get lighter and lighter. So what this demonstrates is that the effects of withdrawal on groundwater discharge are gonna be greater the closer you are to those sites of withdrawal. Um, and the, the impacts tend to lessen as you get further, further away. Okay, so in the next scenario that I'm presenting, we're gonna to try to increase the groundwater withdrawal even further. And in this scenario, we increased the total withdrawal from the Kuala Pula area to about three and a half million gallons per day. And to do that, we actually introduced a hypothetical well in a location that um, was potentially a site that the county was going to look at. Um, and we can see, uh, based on the color coding that we've shown here, um, there's quite a, a kind of a variety of water quality produced by the wells, at least as indicated by the model. Um, some of the wells uh, are green and yellow, which are still less than the EPA secondary standard of 250 milligrams per liter chloride. But the two wells kind of in the middle are purple. And the model indicates that, in fact, those wells, the chloride concentration would exceed 250 milligrams per liter chloride. So that's not really, from a long-term perspective, um, what would be considered sustainable in terms of a you know, drinking water quality production from these wells. So what we did in the next scenario was to kind of try to redistribute the withdrawals a bit so that we could try to bring that chloride concentration from the wells down to more acceptable levels. And in this scenario, although the color codes show that some of the wells still are a little questionable, at least with this distribution and the rates is actually, the total rate is actually the same as the previous slide, but in this scenario, we were able to get the chloride concentration from all the wells uh, to be below EPA secondary standard of 250 milligrams per liter chloride. Um, and as you can see, um, there's quite a bit of these darker colored squares along the, the southern coast, um, which relative to some of the previous slides that I showed. And that's because as you start pumping 
the wells at a greater rate, you're gonna start having a greater effect on uh, the coastal discharge. So the more you pump from the Kuala Pu'u aquifer system, the more you're gonna reduce groundwater discharge to the near shore area. So you can see in this particular slide, um, it's a pretty extensive zone where you have these darker orange colors relative to one of the earlier slides that I showed. Okay, so that's kind of a, a brief overview of what we did. And to summarize, um, we developed a groundwater model to help us evaluate uh, water availability in the Kuala Pu'u area. And the model results indicate that it is possible to increase groundwater withdrawal from the Kuala Pu'u area relative to what is currently being withdrawn, uh, which is about 1.5 million gallons per day. Um, however, the distribution and rate of withdrawals from these wells are kind of important controls on groundwater availability. Um, ultimately, if uh, additional groundwater is withdrawn from the Kuala Pu'u area, there will be an effect and it's up to managers and stakeholders to evaluate whether or not those effects are going to be acceptable or not. Uh, the model is capable of quantifying those effects, but um, no model is going to tell you whether or not those, accepts, uh, those effects are going to be acceptable or not. Okay, so uh, the study has a number of limitations that I wanted to close with. Um, you know, the model that we developed is certainly not perfect. Um, first of all, it's regional in scale. And so we're trying to um, estimate things more on a local scale, what happens at individual wells or what happens at individual locations along the coast. Uh, there's gonna be a bit of uncertainty in the model results, but um, it's kind of the best tool that we have currently to address these issues. Um, the model does contain uncertainty, both in terms of the geology and in terms of the estimated groundwater recharge. And we can certainly improve the model as we get more information. Um, one of the um, aspects of the, of the uh, area that really limits our ability to reduce uncertainty is that there are a limited number of wells in the Kuala Pu aquifer system. Um, in an ideal world, there would be a dense network of monitoring wells throughout the aquifer system and even outside the aquifer system also. Uh, but uh, wells are not uh, cheap to drill. And so we, you know, we made the best of what we had available to us. And so that's, that's it. Um, we have to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was uh, fascinating. And I know you guys worked a long time on this study and um, we were all very interested to see what the results are. So I really appreciate you doing this. Okay, uh, questions, commissioners. Sure, I wonder if I could ask Rory just to remind us which well, where are we in, in the Molokai case? I remember we left one contested case to another and which well is Molokai Ranch using now and which one is Hawaiian Homelands? I don't want to take too much time, but we have such a good model and, uh, and, and presentation that I think it would be helpful. Yeah, well, um, yeah, there's a lot of background since 1992, and well 17 is what Molokai Ranch uses, and they still haven't gotten a permit uh, to pump that well, but, but they do because they, they had existing uses at the time. Um, I mean, that well has been in place since 1950. Um, but um, the contested cases, you know, are, are basically piling. What we were waiting for was this tool to help uh, assess the, the, the three pending applications uh, from Molokai Ranch, DHHL, and the Maui Department of Water Supply. So um, this is what we have now. Um, so I think we can move forward soon uh, with addressing these uh, collectively. Um, which was what, what we were trying to do uh, through the contested case. I have a question, uh, Roy, um, I, or Delwyn, the I know you have uh, measures on the withdrawal in terms of, of salinity levels. 
that are okay and not okay for drinking water. Do we have any studies um, on the impact of more or less fresh water on the coastal areas? I recall there were some people concerned about, about for instance, the impact on Limu potentially, um, although there could be other, uh, other reasons for Limu being better or worse. But do we, do we have any studies on that? They, basically the effect of salinity, various salinity levels on estuary systems. I'm not aware of any specific studies that have been published um, for Molokai. Um, this is kind of a kind of an emerging issue. Uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems, um, emerging issue for the state. Uh, this has been a uh, an issue, for instance, in Kona, near the national park, um, how reduction in groundwater discharge to the park might impact some of the ecosystems there. And so there has been a, uh, some study of salinity effects on selected um, types of fauna in, in the Kona area, um, but um, I'm not aware of any specific studies that have been done on Molokai. Are there ankyline ponds along the South Shore there? Or is it mostly uh, fish ponds and reef systems and limo beds? Yeah, I think it's mostly uh, the latter, so the fish ponds and the, and the coastal areas. Other questions, commissioners? I don't want to, Roy, this is Paul. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it obviously your model and uh, and the color coding um, carefully highlights the the uh, situation there, and I, and I think a cause of a serious concern um, for us and for certainly the utilities involved and the the uh, customers, water customers on Maui. Uh, do you think there's adequate attention, in addition to salinity and uh, the nearshore water potential deterioration? Uh, do you think there's adequate attention be devoted to the need for redundancy um, on these wells? Uh, I think the need for that sort of concern and attention it was highlighted just recently when uh, the Department of Water Supply on Maui, I think, had three wells out in the Wailuku Aquifer. Um, and uh, that was certainly an extraordinary situation. But, but uh, you know, do one well out on, on Molokai would be a, a very serious concern, and two would be, uh, uh, you know, a community, uh, a real community problem. Um, do you have any, do you think they're paying attention to that right now? Yeah, the, the county actually um, is considering um, drilling another production well as a replacement for their existing well. And so we had discussions with them about that. And so some of those proposed well sites that were modeled were sites that the county was uh, looking into as potential replacement or redundant sites for their existing well. Um, so they, they are aware of that and they are trying to address it. Thank you, Roy, do you have any comments yeah. on that? Yeah, and just to add, you know, um, in addition to redundancy is just the, the localizing effects, you know, spreading out the pumpage, as you can see, all the wells are, are near each other and um, you have this, you know, large aquifer, um, but they're all pumping out of one spot and you don't want to do that because it overstresses that one. So I think in some of the scenarios they were, you know, moving east and west with, with those additional wells, A and B, I think. Um, and they don't necessarily have to pump more, um, uh, but it, it does provide that redundancy and spreads out the pumpage. So you have that backup and you're also reducing the sh that, you know, concentrated and focused stress in one spot. Thank you. Other questions? Sure, this is, this is Neil again. I just, Neil, I just want to make sure I get the right interpretation. I mean, the increasing the withdrawal is definitely going to have uh, an impact on uh, traditional customary practice. Well, the, the increase in withdrawal, if it's maintained for a, a long-term period, is going to cause a reduction in the groundwater discharge that would naturally occur otherwise. 
So if you started pumping a well uh, a million gallons per day, you know, at a rate of a million gallons per day and you did it forever, um, the discharge that otherwise would have occurred either to streams or to the ocean is going to be reduced by that same amount. And so if you're pumping well for a long time at a rate of a million gallons per day, you're going to reduce the natural groundwater discharge, whatever that may occur, um, by that same amount that you're pumping. So yeah, it's, it's going to have an impact. So is that, uh, let's see, so that, that, that was in part my first question is like, how much of an impact? And I think we don't, we don't know that, but, but it will reduce the amount of fresh water flow. Are you also saying that there are, I guess they would be gaining streams, I suppose, um, on the east side, mid middle to east side, so that the stream water also will have less water in it at a um, certain it, elevation? Um, not likely on, if you pump Kuala Pu'u, that's uh, not likely gonna affect streams in those Northeast Valley, valleys, like Pelikunu or Wailao. Um, but it just a, as a general statement, groundwater typically will discharge to streams and in our island settings, they'll also, groundwater also discharges to the ocean. And so depending on where you put your well, you're gonna affect that groundwater discharge. So if we put a well in Pelikun Valley on the north side, uh, very likely you're gonna reduce uh, groundwater discharge to Pelikun Stream. But if we drill a well right near the coast along the southern coastline of, of the island, uh, we're not likely going to affect stream flow. We're more likely to affect or will affect uh, groundwater discharge to the ocean. So it really depends on where you put the well as to what form of groundwater discharge you're going to you know, impact. And just to add to what Delwin said, in the Commission's Water Resource Protection Plan, when you do drill in a dike area, um, high level dike, like on the, the east end, the assumption is you're going to affect stream flow one to one. That's, you know, when you're in basal areas, that's not the case. And usually it's typically more at the coastline. And the, the basal la la layer would be thinner near the coastline. Is that right? Um, yeah. Yes. So it might take less time to start to impact salinity levels. Um, it, that's going to be a function of, of where you yeah. pump well, um, the, the timing. It's, okay. it, it's a function of, you know, how thick the lens is, but also how close the well is to that area of natural discharge. So if you're pumping a well real close to the ocean, you're going to reach a new kind of equilibrium condition in which you'll see what the salinity change will be relatively quickly as opposed to putting a well further inland where it takes a greater amount of time for that effect to be kind of widespread and reach an equilibrium, equilibrium condition. Very so yeah, where you yeah, pump there, and how much you pump. Yeah, I think there's, there's no doubt that when you pump, you're gonna impact what leaks to either a stream or the coast. It's gotta, you know, what used to go there is gonna come out of the well instead. The real question is, well, what does that impact do to the fauna and, and, and the natural environment? And can they tolerate the salinity changes? That's, that's what we're trying to, to assess in these, uh, well, in, La, um, in um, uh, Keaho, we had a symposium to try to get at that question. And there still needs to be a lot more work done on that. Thank you. Is an emerging, emerging issue kind of nationwide. Yeah. Yeah, really it's interesting. Groundwater dependent yeah. ecosystems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Mr. Kateyama. Oh, thank you, Chair. Roy, the difference between the water added in scenario one and scenario two is predicated on the permit applications that are pending. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yes, there's now, a slight. Um, if I just so I can put a caveat on that, the information that um, and just to be transparent, the information that Dellen had was what we had at the time. Uh, subsequent to when they were running these scenarios, there was a um, 
in uh, the earlier part of 2019, we got a, an update from Molokai Ranch and they increased uh, their request by about 100,000 gallons. So there, there's a slight difference there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they're uh, basically what um, are the pending applications. What is missing, yeah, um, I think in all of the scenarios uh, is the reservation because we haven't talked uh, much about that, but there is a reservation for Hawaiian homelands of almost 3 million gallons, you know, more than half of the sustainable yield estimate. Um, so that's set aside. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't looked at that, just the pending applications. So is there a scenario that comprehends all the reservations? In addition um, to the per I think you have you have to ask the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there could be many. Um, hopefully, it's one where you know pumpage is spread out and not you know you increase from your existing wells and continuing to increase the stress in that one you know spot on the island where there's a lot of pumpage going on. Mm, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Roy. Any other questions? Okay, great presentation, great study. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really appreciate all your work on it. Super interesting and will be very important um, for us moving all moving forward.